Welcome to Coffee with Kyla, Dr. Tracy Brower. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So cheers, first of all. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. You are such a bright mind and we love your insights. Um, and why don't we have you first introduce yourself and give a little bit about your um, background? Sounds great. Thanks again for having me. Really looking forward to our conversation. My name is Tracy Brower, as you mentioned, and I'm a principal with the Applied Research and Consulting Team with Steelcase. And uh, I have my PhD in sociology, specifically the sociology of work. And I've written a book called Bring Work to Life by Bringing Life to Work, which kind of looks at alternative ways to think about work-life balance yeah. and new ways of thinking about that. And I'm a contributor with Forbes.com and Fast Company. Thank you so much. Um, well, I've read a lot of your articles, so I'm really excited to have your voice here on Coffee with Kyla and get your perspective on a couple of things. So the first question we always ask everyone is, what behavior have you developed during this time that you hope becomes a habit or maybe already has? Oh, I love that question. That's really good. You know, I've gotten really better. <laughs> You're going to laugh. I've gotten really better at eating fruits and vegetables. <laughs> That's great. Mom would be very happy. I don't know if I'm overall eating more healthfully. I'm pretty sure I'm not overall eating more healthfully, but I'm eating a lot more fruits and vegetables. So that must be a very good thing. <laughs> That's great. You know, I planted an herb garden this year for the first time, oh. which has been new for me. I've you know, I've cooked a little bit here and there, but I think that the herb garden and just spending more time in my kitchen has changed tremendously during this time. So I've gotten my skills a little stronger there. It's cool. <laughs> so Tracy, you wrote an article in 2019 for Fast Company called, We Need to Stop Striving for Work-Life Balance and Here's Why. This, I will tell you, this article really resonated me, with me um, as a working parent, um, volunteering, things that I do in the community. It, I was always kind of struggling with this idea of balance and the word balance really just didn't seem achievable to me. So I'm just curious, what is your perspective on that now and how has balance, how the word balance insinuates that we can separate life and work? And I think during this time, there's no separation. We have school going on at the dining room table. People are working from the dining room table. Um, our social and physical spaces are all together. So I'd love to hear your point of view on maybe what the pandemic has done for your thoughts on that article. Yeah. You know, it's really funny, Kyla, because I think about when I when I went back to school, I went back for, I don't know, the third time. Right. And uh, <laughs> our son was five at the time and he told his kindergarten class, my mom went back to school again because she couldn't get it right the first time. <laughs> so I just about that. And, you know, now he's going off to college. It's like been that long. I can't even believe it. But that was the moment where I kind of had the same reaction you did, Kyla, like this yeah. balance isn't really working. And and work is part of a full life. Work is not a bad thing. Work is a yeah. good thing. And, and we get to make a contribution. So that's all good. I think what's really changed is that we used to talk a lot about how do we get work life on the radar screen and how do we get people who make senior decisions and organizations to think about work life and the importance of work life and all that. And I think it's so on our radar screens now because everybody's yeah. struggling with just what you talked about, right? Like yeah. we've got kids in one room and us in another and, you know, all these things going on in our lives that are all kind of blending together more than ever. So yeah. One, I think we're appreciating this idea of work life more. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is really different now and, and kind of interesting and exciting is all of the work life literature over the years has always been about how do we separate work? How do we leave work at the office? How do we leave yeah. work behind and have time for personal? And now we're in this 180 degree shift where we're hearing people say, you know, I could use a little distance from my people. I yeah. love my people, but my circle is small and it would be great to get out of the house a little more. So I yeah. think that there's this like really healthy boundary that can exist between work and life. And I think that separation is really kind of a myth, like work and life always come together. And that's a good thing, right? Like that brings us fulfillment. And I think we have to think about like, what is that right boundary for us? It's healthy to have work 
kind of a little bit separate, a little bit of a boundary to the rest of our lives. Um, and it's really healthy, I think, to think pretty explicitly about it. Like, I think it's brought so much more at a conscious level versus a subconscious level in terms of just, we're just running back and forth to the office and we're kind of living our lives without that consciousness. I think this has brought so much to the surface. So I think those are some of the things that have changed. Just a starting list. Yeah, um, I think that also the idea of being purposeful with your time has emerged um, through all of this. And not only from you know, if you're an associate within an organization, but also organizational leaders are starting to see that and support it because we've all been put through the same thing. For the first time, we are all dealing with this one circumstance. So I think that, that having that one theme to relate to on an associate level and a leader level and your kids are dealing with it, and your parents are dealing with it, um, has brought this kind of level playing field with perspective. Yeah, I love that idea. That's really good. It does. It brings some um, equanimity to it, right? Like yeah. one of the things I've always said about work life is there's definitely this ebb and flow, right? Like you can have an ebb and flow in your day. You can have yeah. an ebb and flow in your week or your month. Or you think about like the seasons of the school year, even when children are learning from home, there's still a bit of an ebb and a flow. And I think we're seeing that at like a macro level today, right? Like, oh my gosh, we're in this weird place and someday we'll get back to a little bit more regularity that we might have been used to. It'll be different, but we'll get back a little. So it's like this macro sense of ebb and flow and okay. and we're all in it. I love your comment that we're kind of all in it. The other thing I would point to here, which I think is so important in our work life dialogue, is that all work has dignity. Um, you know, like like I think we can say to ourselves, oh, well, you know, work life is different in this kind of profession or different in that kind of industry or different in that kind of company. And all of us, whatever work we do, it's so valuable. We bring something through our ability to contribute and our contributions to society bring value for us and for others. And I think we've been reminded about that through the pandemic and your comments about you know we're kind of all going through it i think are right there and the the last thing i would say about this is that i think we can sometimes have this myth of of perfection like oh i need to get this right this is yeah. about balance it's precarious look at kyla's doing it so well and i need to catch up with <laughs> kyla or i need to catch up with so and so or so and so or so and so yeah i think that um comparisons actually comparison the more we compare with others the less happy we are with ourselves yeah. that's literally a, a truth sociologically yeah so i think we have to quit the like oh i've got to get the perfect work-life balance thing i think yeah. it's really more about like finding your own right answer there are multiple right answers and what balance quote unquote or better yet fulfillment looks like today might be different than tomorrow this season yeah. might be different than next season just when you feel like you're catching up and you've got the right equilibrium it's going to change again change so it. i think that's the other thing that we learn through this is that we are always going to be in this state of flux and work life is a great context for how we want to continue to adapt and adjust yeah. awesome i so that is a really good segue into my next question. Just changing the language of, um, you know, how we say either balance or uh, fulfillment, using that change in language can really impact our perspective on things. And you have written and spoken about this in depth. So what helpful language shifts can you suggest to help us adjust our perspective in this season of life? I like that question. This is, it was really fun because um, our daughter was learning in a, um, I think she was in a psych class and she was in like early high school and she came home and she was talking about mom, linguistic determinism. We were talking about linguistic determinism at school today. I'm like, cool, linguistic determinism. <laughs> That's what we're talking about, right? It sounds so snazzy and it is because the way that we talk about things, the way that we perceive things absolutely affects not only our behavior, but our beliefs. And so like if we talk all about balance, 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 we're going to be on this balance beam all the time and kind of in this precarious state and we're never going to quite be at equilibrium. 
But I think the alternatives are things like work life integration, right? Like they come together and they integrate however much integration yeah. looks like for you. Or I always like work life harmony or work life yeah. navigation. The idea that you're always kind of navigating through or my very favorite is work life fulfillment. I just think that um, again, if work is part of a full life, part of our fulfillment comes through really thinking about how that is important to us. And it doesn't have to be fancy work, right? Like when yeah. we make a contribution to others, that's a really big deal. Yeah, that's so great um, that even the word balance insinuates that you might fall. Yeah. So when you said harmony, that just has such a different connotation to life that these notes can flow together and they don't have to be one or the other. They can all live together. Yeah, that's beautifully said. I love that idea of harmony and that idea of, you know, differences coming together. And I think the cool thing about the idea of harmony or any of these is that it's your right answer. You know, like yeah. my right answer might be different than yours. That's mm -hmm. okay. It yeah. all kind of comes together through it all. Yeah, I guess I, when I'm, you know, speaking with friends or even colleagues, um, number one thing I always encourage people is just because it's right for someone else doesn't mean it has to be right for you. And, and giving people the power to do those decisions for themselves, you know, is, is a little intimidating when you're surrounded by social media and news and others' opinions. Um, but I think it is so great for your well-being and your mental health to pick what's right for you and stand by that and follow through. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. There's some re sociological research that was done several years ago, but it's pretty um, fundamental and foundational in the field. And it looked at women. It was particular to women, even though we know work life is about all genders and all stages of life and with or without kids. But in this case, it was women with kids. And they looked at whether women were working full time or part time or not working. And then they looked at like the happiness and satisfaction and success of their children and kind of the mindsets of their children. And they found that the most important thing was not the kind of way that women were working. It was whether they were satisfied with it. Oh, Isn't wow. that cool? Like their kids were their kids were most engaged, most satisfied, most fulfilled, most happy when the woman was happy with whatever choice it was. So yeah. it kind of gets at that idea of we might all be in different places and hopefully we're empowered to make some choices. I mean, let's face it. I think it's something like 84% of women work, right? So we don't always have the choice to work or not to work, but we may have choices about what we do and how we um, create our schedules, maybe, yeah. right? And so the yeah. more we're happy with those choices, the more we create happiness in whatever situation that is, the better it is for our families. Yeah, so again, perfect segue into my next question. So our younger generations are growing up in this, um, they'll have a COVID impact on their lives. Um, you know, I was in college during 9-11 and really starting the workforce during the 08 economic crash. And that really affected, you know, my perspective and work ethic as an adult and moving forward. So I would love to hear your perspective on what this COVID impact will have for our younger people and maybe some promising attributes that they might have um, as they grow up. Yeah, you know, I love this question. I had to write an article about it because I was so curious about it myself because our kids, our daughter graduated from college in the midst of this and our son graduated from high school in the midst of this is, and now is starting as a freshman in school. And it's just yeah. like, it's it's tough, right? And if children are younger, um, that is a big deal too because it's all framing. I saw this great article, um, Kyla. It was, it was something like from the graduating class of 2008, to the graduating class of 2020. Oh my and it, was, gosh. it was this really cool article about like, it was really tough. We graduated yeah. in a huge recession. Here's what right. we did, here's what we learned. Anyway, so it makes me think of your um, your timing as well. Yeah. But I think, I think one of the things that we can be optimistic about is the extent to which we are gonna be shaped toward thinking about community, right? Like, yeah. like we talk a lot about how our behaviors impact on others, right? Yeah. 
we talk a lot about the choices we make and how they impact on others. So I think that'll be positive for the um, people who are growing up during this generation. It will have an impact on all of us, but we know in terms of generational science that there's this extra outsized impact when you're forming your own perceptions and you're going through those. So I think community is one. I think another that could be really interesting is the idea of empathy. Like um, mental health issues are at a greater um, sort of problematic level than ever. But yeah. the good news about that is that we're talking about it. And I think mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing more people kind of be open about their struggles. And so I think that can also be shaping is within this context of community and my choices and how my choices affect others. I also realize what people might be going through and have more empathy. Yeah. And I think another element is all about presence. Like um, I heard somebody say, what if this is the generation that can enjoy sitting home on a Friday night with their families doing a puzzle, right? <laughs> like <laughs> that was sort of wow. unheard of <laughs> six months ago, right? That would be yeah. extraordinarily lame. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I think this like, this has forced us in some ways to slow down. Yeah. It's forced us to potentially be more present. Mm -hmm. It's forced us to, you know, spend time with smaller groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to a friend of mine and she said, you know, they had a birthday party for her child. And instead of the, you know, whiz bang, like Chuck E. Cheese and a hundred kids <laughs> and prizes and like all the hoopla, right. Yeah. They had a small gathering at home, but it was more about like the meaning of the celebration than all yeah. the you know, fanfare of the celebration. So I think those broadly those ideas of community and those ideas of presence might really give our um, children an opportunity to grow. I don't know if that's making any sense to you, Kyla. Oh gosh, it makes total sense. I feel, I think that we are all, you know, even with um, the, what you had talked about earlier about the conversations about mental health and the conversations about social equalities and the conversations about your community and supporting one another are just things that weren't everyday conversation. And now they are. And now we have the tools to have those conversations in early years so that, um, you know, those those big topics seem a little less daunting because, you know, we've lived through this. <laughs> Exactly. That things moving forward just feel a little more comfortable and the doors have opened up a little bit for us to have the dialogue that maybe was missing before. Yeah, I think your point, I totally agree with your point. We've just, we've had the opportunity to make it a dialogue that's more natural, right? Like it's, yeah. it, it's brought to the surface and, and that's true. Like in organizational culture studies, right? We know that the more explicit you are about talking about norms and values and assumptions, the better for the health of the organization or the team. And that's yeah. true of societies too. So that making it explicit. And I think that leads to learning, right? Like that to me, oh, that's yeah. another broad theme yeah. about where we go from here in terms of this generation, what where this generation goes from here. Yeah. And I think we're we're learning new things, right? Like we're kind of forced to, oh my gosh, I'm gonna figure out how to make sourdough bread, you know, at a micro <laughs> level. Yeah. But we've got to figure out um we've got to figure out how to be together differently. Like mm -hmm. we've got to learn how to learn. We've got to learn how to adapt. We have to learn how to communicate in new ways. Like there's all this super interesting um, data about trust and about um, like interpretation of micro expressions and understanding people non-verbally. And those are really harder when you're, you know, when you have a mask oh, covering super important for health right now. Yeah. But I think that maybe this generation learns how to learn, learns how to adapt, learns some new skills, and learns some new approaches in terms of communication. Like how do we enrich communication? How do we think about communication differently? How do we um, really start to pick up new cues from each other? And um, we'll have such a bond, right? Like sociologically yeah. speaking, oh, one yeah. of the biggest ways that you bond is through going through really hard times together. Yeah. And I think it's all too about um, creativity and grit. Like the, the 
best innovations come when we have the greatest barriers, right? Like, like if you if you don't have any barriers, you can do things in the same old way. But if you are facing incredible constraints, you got to figure out a new way. And right. grit too is about like um, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and problem solving and improvising and getting through. And so I like to think optimistically that this generation is going to have this like, ah, this grit, this stick to this ability yeah. to get through, this ability to have new perspective on hard things. So yeah. I, it's a definitely a glass half full idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I am hopeful. I'm always um, thinking in the terms of if I'm going to go through this, what can I learn from it? And I'm hopeful that at the other, you know, the other side of this, I don't, it will definitely not be a switch or going over the rainbow by any means. But I think, you know, as we emerge, my, my hope, my half glass, my glass half full is that we have learned some skills um, through, I think it takes a major disruption to make any sort of major changes and and that's what i'm looking forward to what you know what emerges from this and where we end up yeah oh that's beautifully said there's a um there's a wonderful book about um really really hard times and what societies have learned through hard times it's by an author called Salnit, and she talks about the latin root of the word emergency is emerger and emerger means that from these difficult times come these new learnings. And so if it's true that the more difficult the situation, the greater the learning, we yeah. shall be brilliant by the end of this. Yeah. So it'll I be think a that's great 2021, really right? Yeah, there we, there we go. <laughs> that's the plan. <laughs> well, that's a perfect note to end on, Tracy. Um, like I said, we so appreciate your time and your mind and insights on everything that we're going through right now. And thank you so much for being a guest this morning. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate our conversation. That was great. Thank you, Tracy. Have a good day. You too.